We're in John's Gospel, chapter 12. John started the Gospel by recording the first miracle he records in his text is what? The wedding at Cana, where he turned water into wine. Wedding, weddings, marriage is so important to God. It all began with a marriage, didn't it? Between who? Adam Wasn't Adam and Steve? No. Uh, editorial correction. I confused Capital Baptist Church with Greenville Baptist Church. Capital Baptist Church is the church in, in D.C. that has two lesbian co-pastors that co-pastor the church, not Greenville, okay? But Greenville is very woke. Greenville Baptist downtown is very woke and very open to the LGBTQXYZ. Yeah, sure. But the point I'm making right now is just that I'm making a correction. It wasn't Greenville, it was Capital Baptist, okay? Uh, I was reading the articles at the same time, and uh, I confused the two. So I do apologize for that. But they are as woke as Capital Baptist. <laughs> Make no mistake about that. Marriage is so important. Marriage is between one biological man and one biological woman until death do them part. It is so important to God. God instituted marriage. Where you see polygamy in the Bible, it's simply being descriptive, not prescriptive. It's describing the situation, but it's not what God desires at all, is it? It begins with a marriage, it ends with a marriage. Which marriage is that? Yeah. The marriage of the church to Jesus Christ. And in chapter 12, the Christian home, the godly home, the home that is really given over to surrendering to the Lord, to worshiping the Lord, to acknowledging the Lord is so important to our God. So in chapter 12, what, what is taking place? There's a dinner party in a home that loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are the three principal participants of the dinner party? Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. He so loved this family, and he was so at home in this home. Now, Simon the leper was part of that, that community, that family. This is a family, you see. You see, we, you are more my family than my biological unsafe family will ever be. Thankful for those who are in my biological family who are saved, but, but, but they're nowhere near as my kin as you are. Is that not true? Yeah, the fellowship that we have, what is that Greek word for fellowship? Koinonia. Koinonia, the, koinonia, the communion that we have, it's because of him. It's all centered around him. It's all the result of him. When you gather together Thursday, you should acknowledge the fact that our gathering together is because of him. The koinonia. How he, he always, he's always welcome and comfortable in a home that will acknowledge him and put him first. Now, when you, when you don't, it's only to your own detriment because there's so much he'd like to do in your life. Look what he did for this home, for these few who loved him so. And it said in the text, he agapeo Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Lazarus was dead, but now he's alive. That's us, isn't it? And as a result of that, we worship him like Mary, sitting at his feet continually. And then, therefore, we get up off of our knees and we, like Martha, serve, serve. serve. So the question this morning is, do you, do you, is the Lord comfortable in the home of your heart? Are you acknowledging him in all that you do? Yesterday, fellas, I said we have a stewardship that we're going to give account to God. One day we're going to be accountable to God for our stewardship in what? Everything. One day you and I will give an account and we'll only stand before the Lord by ourselves. No one will stand with us. It'll just be me and the Lord. And he'll ask me to give an account of everything. I don't want to be ashamed. Now, there is therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You won't be condemned of anything, but, but you surely will suffer a loss of reward if you don't choose to make him the priority of your life and your relationships now. And, you're, and you, when you don't do that, you're only bringing hurt, harm on yourself. Why? There's so much he wants to do. There is so much in his heart for you and for me, far beyond anything we would want for ourselves. But our lack of 
honoring our Father in heaven causes us not to receive false blessings. Honor your father and mother with a promise. What's the promise? That'll be well with you and you'll live long upon the earth. If, if the church is not your mother, God is not your father. Do you know that? The church is where we are nurtured. The church is where we grow. The church is where we disciple. The church, we come in as babes, right? And what do babies do? Eat and make messes. That's all. <laughs> they like to eat and make messes, and then they go to sleep. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's that environment of the church is where we grow together. Ephesians 4. You with me on that? We have too many people, they're, they're believers, but not belongers. They said they believe in the Lord, but they don't belong anywhere. They go here, they go there, they go here, they go there. You know, but they're never part of that koinonia. That koinonia, that word is not just fellowship. What, is it, what, are, what are the other three English words that are interpret this word koinonia? Partnership. Partnership. Contribution. Contribution. Communion. Communion, same word. But it's so pregnant with meaning. We're partnering together for the gospel. We're contributing one another in each other's lives. And we are a holy communion because of the work and the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Is that not all true? Yeah. So we, we talked last week at length at this section here at the dinner party that was taking place in honor of Jesus and what he had done for Lazarus, their brother, and for Simon, the leper. But we ended up last week, uh, let's see. Chapter 12, verse 12. Do you have a heading in your Bible? No, you're in verse 9. Verse 12 of 12. 12, 12. Was it? No. No. It's always been a, uh, an enigma to me or a mystery as to why they call it the triumphal entry. This is the, going to be the beginning of the national rejection of Jesus by his own they will reject the light and desire to go further and further into the darkness, right? Now, it says, the next day, a great multitude had come to the feast. What feast is this? Passover. So what day is this? Jesus is making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's going to present himself to the nation as what? Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So what day is this specifically? This is a very specific day. The 10th day. day of the Jewish month, Nazan. Nazan. What happens four days from now? The sacrifice of the lambs at Passover. What gate did Jesus walk into as he was making his way into the center of the city? The sheep's gate. And what sheep would go into the sheep's gate on this very day, the 10th day of Nazan? The sheep's, you remember, you all remember very well, don't you? Yeah. These are the sheep that would be raised by the temple shepherds out in that pasture that was designated for the sheep that would be raised for sacrifice to Hashem by the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And that area outside of Bethlehem where these sheep were raised, what was that called? The Migdal Edar. The Migdal Edar. How many of you have never heard of the Migdal Edar? Okay. And the rest of you aren't willing to raise your hands, are you? Well, it's Okay. Listen, the more we realize we know, the more we realize we don't know. You know, what we come to the conclusion of, we're a massive ignorance. Isn't that true? It's true. I can't believe how many things I am ignorant of. But one day I will know as I am known. <laughs> but the Migdal Edar is a fabulous, uh, fabulous truth that has been, unfortunately, so absent in everybody's Christmas stories. Because... That's where he was born. And we'll talk more about that as we get closer to Christmas. But nonetheless, Jesus was entering into Jerusalem from the sheep's gate. Listen to me. He's entering in as all of these sheep that were, had been raised were going into the sheep's gate, raised by the temple priests and the temple shepherds, and they would be the sheep that you would purchase when you went in to make sacrifice unto the Lord on Passover. They would always make sure that your, your lamb didn't measure up. They would always find a blemish or a, some kind of an injury, some kind of a defect in your lamb. Now you need to purchase one of our lambs. 
But isn't it amazing? The Lamb of God is coming in to Jerusalem through the sheep's gate with all of these sheep surrounding him. And then this has been going on for centuries. Since Leviticus 23, the sheep offered for sacrifice. And he's presenting himself as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Wow. We're, we're, we're told that the only person who really caught on to what was be going to be taking place very soon was who? Mary. Leave her alone. She has done these things for my burial. Leave her alone. She's the only one that really understands what's taking place. She heard my words and she believed everything I said as much as it grieved her heart, as much as she would want to reject that truth that I would be crucified. Leave her alone. She gets it. Now, Honest John's going to tell you, they didn't get it. <laughs> How many of you have never heard of the Migdal Eater? Okay, a few more of you are more honest. <laughs> Verse 12, chapter 12, the next day, a great multitude had come to the feast. And when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna. Hosanna means? Save now, save now Lord, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right? Baruch Ababa Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, they were always waiting for the king to come. And what did they think the king was going to do for them? Bring about a rebellion to overthrow the occupation of the Romans. But that's not how he came. Now, where are we in Daniel on Wednesday nights? Chapter 9. Uh, we Fascinating, wasn't it? How I explained to you all of the scriptures that would indicate the very day in which the judgment of Israel would end. And, and when we did all the calculation and we looked at all those scriptures, it was mind-blowing, wasn't it? And what date did we come to? The fifth month of the year, 1948. Wow. Wasn't that amazing? Yes. Now, next time, we're not going to meet this Wednesday, and then the following Wednesday is communion. So the Wednesday after that, we'll go deeper into chapter 9, where Daniel, Daniel is privileged to understand and give the date specifically of the first and the second coming of Jesus. This day, the 10th day of Nizan, in the year in which the Lord, our Lord was crucified, this day was prophesied by the prophet Daniel to the very day. Now, I'm not going to go into that tonight. But if you're here two weeks from Wednesday, you'll hear it. Very specific. Bible prophecy. God foretelling a matter long before it takes place. Knowing the end at the beginning, right? It's, it's, for me, it's so comforting. It so assures me of the word of God. Amen? But nonetheless, they, the, the, they were singing the Halals. And this was a, a reference to the Halal that he is the Messiah. This is a claim they're making. Hosanna, Hosanna, this is the Messiah. The Halals were the Psalms that they would sing during Passover, during Feast of Tabernacles. That was Psalm, what was it, Psalm? 113 to 118. That's right. These are the Halals. That would be sung. 113 through 118. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, Jesus said at the last Passover, and we'll get into that later on, that he won't drink the fruit of the vine, wine, again until when? He drinks it in his Father's kingdom anew. When they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, in sincerity of heart. Baruch abatah b'shem Adonai. We don't say that now, do we? We say, Blessed is the Lord, our God. Because we know him now, don't we? Is he our portion? We talked about that yesterday, right, fellas? The portion of Jacob is our portion? Mm -hmm. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And then Jesus, when he had found a young colt, a donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. This is a quote from the scriptures of what would take place. They realized that after the fact, but this is a quote from Zechariah. And what was it indicating for them? What? 
came in peace. He came in peace, not in revolution. He wasn't going to overthrow the Romans. He wasn't going to upset the government. What he wants to do is overthrow the sin in your heart. Some people, if you're HIV positive, that's pretty serious, isn't it? But Jesus acknowledges that we are all, every one of us, SIN positive, right? <laughs> and we, we need a cure from that. He would be that cure. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming. And in Zechariah's text, it says, lowly in humility, sitting upon a donkey's colt. That would represent he would come in peace. If he was coming as a victor, how would he come? And how was he coming the second time? On a white horse. The second time Jesus comes, the second coming of Jesus Christ, he will be on a white horse. He is the victor. That will be the triumphal entry. His disciples did not understand. Thank you, John. John's such an honest guy, isn't he? Humble, honest. We didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified after his resurrection and his ascension to heaven, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. You know, it's so important that as you're reading the scriptures and you have questions, write those questions down and go dig out the answer. For years, that was my seminary. I didn't go to cemetery school, seminary. I, mean. I said it tongue in cheek, you know. Uh, seminary is wonderful if you're a spirit filled individual, but a lot of people lost their faith going to seminary, unfortunately, because of the liberalism that's gone into these institutions. But when you study the scriptures and you have a question, jot that question down and start to dig in, search out the answer. It's our God who would conceal a matter. But it's the privilege of kings to do what? To seek out the answer. Proverbs says that. Our God will conceal a matter. Well, well, these mysteries, well, what does that all mean? But, but it's, if you want to be a child of the king, a prince, princess, kingly, you seek out what its meaning is. And so John, John and the other disciples, you know, they didn't really understand what this was all about. But, but later on, they remembered as they were digging through and said, why would he quote Zechariah? What does that have to do with, oh, yes. You've got to think critically when you read the Bible. So if you have a question, don't be prideful. Don't say you know when you don't know. Dig out the answers, right? We didn't know. We didn't understand. But therefore, the people, verse 17, who were with him, when they called Lazarus out of the, who were with him, when he had called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, they bore witness. So previously we had the seekers, remember? The great multitude they gathered together, that's verse 12, that's the seekers. But now, now we have the true followers of Jesus Christ who witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus, and now we're bearing witness. Shouldn't you bear witness of the resurrection of Lazarus? Which Lazarus, Russell? You're Lazarus. You're born again? You're raised from the dead. <coughs> now, you got this wonderful privilege, as does everybody in this room, if you're born again, to go declare to the world, Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Who's Lazarus? Are you seekers or are you followers? So Thursday, what should you be telling people? I was dead, but now I'm alive. And the difference, not that I met a turkey, I met the lamb. Amen? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're going to be so convicted if you're silent on Thursday. And that's my intention, you know, to make, make sure I convict you so much that you, won't, you can't be still. Like Jeremiah, it'll be fire in your bones. You'll have to say something, you know. <laughs> For this reason, the people also met him. Because they heard that he had done this sign, this miracle, that, that he raised Lazarus from the dead. And so not only did they want to see Jesus, but they wanted to talk to Lazarus. Wouldn't you like to talk to Lazarus? Yeah. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, you see that we are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world is going after this man. Now, is that true? That's a hyperbole, right? But basically, he came for the world. For God so loved the world, and the whole world will hear about Jesus. As you go to the library on the 18th with us, and if you really take your time and go through it, you'll realize that God used this milk farmer's son to give the gospel to the world. 
It's unbelievable. Bill, Billy Graham's no theologian. His, his daughter is a better theologian than he is, you know, and Graham Lodz. But he was such a humble, available, yielded, surrendered servant to God that it's absolutely mind-blowing what God did with this farmer. Unbelievable. You'll go up there and you'll see a portrait of one, one outdoor speaking engagement in Seoul, South Korea. One outdoor speaking engagement. He spoke to more people than most pastors will speak to in their lifetime. How many people was it? 1,100,000 people. It's a sea of people that he's sharing the gospel with. That's just one speaking opportunity. It's amazing. It gives me goosebumps talking about it. I, Listen, all right, so God used Billy Graham in that, in that way. But, but, but all that's required of a servant is to be faithful. How does God want to use you? You, you may never speak to a million people. I don't, I don't think I'd ever want to speak to a million people. I think I'd, I'd get scared. But if God calls you, he'll equip you, right? But what has God called you to do? Are you yielded? Are you surrendered? Are you doing it? Are you living his life or yours? Your vessel, Pastor David mentioned on Friday night when he was leading the worship at the end, that, you know, you know your, your vessel, this cup, can only hold a certain amount of fluid. What is it, maybe uh, 12 ounces, 16 ounces? So if it's, if it's half me and half Jesus, is that good? That ain't good. How about if it's three quarters me and I leave a quarter for Jesus? Well, that ain't good at all, is it? It's going the wrong direction, right? What should it be? More and more, like John the Baptist, I must decrease. He must increase, right? I need to pour out my life and allow him to fill me. Now, listen, I, how many years have you been a Christian? I don't know. Answer the question in your own mind. How many years have you been a Christian? And how much of you is still left in the glass? And how much of Jesus is displaced? Are you really allowing yourself to be poured out for him? That's the question, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Now, if you're not, you're living a very selfish, self-centered life. For he who would seek to, seek to save his life will. Now do, you, now, do you lose your salvation? No. no. What do you lose? No. You lose all those blessings that the Lord wants to bring into your life and the way in which he wants to use you. Billy Graham said, pour me out, Lord, pour me out. And wow. Amazing. He goes to communist Russia and he almost gets arrested and he's there at the stadium in Moscow and he, and he prays that God will allow him to speak there and they, they throw him out of the country. He's an atheist. And then years later, he's got the Russian army singing the battle of him of the Republic as he's leading a crusade in Moscow. It's amazing. It's amazing. How surrendered, how yielded. This Thanksgiving, make a difference. Listen, that's going to be a platform for you, right? Lovingly, graciously, humbly, just share the truth. Now, what they do with it, that's their business. But it is your responsibility because we're drawing close. We're drawing to the end. And it's time to become courageous. For this reason, the people came and the Pharisees said, don't you see the whole world is chasing after him? And that's who he came for, the whole world. Verse 20, now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. Remember Jesus said in John chapter 10, there are other sheep. I have other sheep. He was not talking about Israel, but other sheep were who? The Gentiles. And now we know his hour has come. And now we know that Jesus' ministry to the Jews is over because now the Gentiles, these aren't Hellenists. These aren't Jews who, who embrace Greek culture. That's what a Hellenist is. These are Greeks. they like heroes. Tamales. <laughs> no, it's not a gyro. <laughs> it's a gyro. <laughs> but uh, Jesus recognizes, you know, now it's going to be a ministry unto the Gentiles. Jesus came for the lost house of Israel. After his death, his resurrection, his ascension, then the Holy, Spirit, Holy Spirit's ministry was to the Gentile world. So these Greeks came among them, come to worship at the feast, and they came to Philip, Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and they asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. 
Philip came and he told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew told, and Philip told Jesus. And look at how Jesus answers their request. These Greeks have come, and they want to speak to you, Jesus. And what does Jesus say? The hour has come. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jews knew that, when Jesus knew that what? His hour had come. Chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. This is it. For three years now, he's, he's saying, it's not my time, it's not my time, my hour's not come, it's not my time, it's not my hour's not come. Now, now, at this moment, this is the passion of the Christ. This is his last week of his life. He's making entrance into Jerusalem, declaring himself to be the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. The Passover. When John said that, when John baptized Jesus on the shore of the Jordan, he said, behold, the lamb of God, he said, behold, the Passover. Pishka. Pesach in the, in the Greek text. The Lamb of God, meaning the festival of Passover or the specific sacrifice of Passover. Behold, the Passover is what he said. Now, only the Jews would have understood what he was talking about on that bank that day, but many of them were clueless. The Passover. What is that word for the burnt offering on the Passover? Holocaust. Holocaust. Wow, what meaning. Yeah. And Jesus answered them saying, the hour has not yet has come. The hour has come that the son of man should be glorified and he'll be glorified by laying down his life. He wins by surrendering. That's how you win, exactly. You want everything that God has for you? You want to enjoy all of the blessings that God could possibly have in his heart for you? Obedience. I raise my son to understand that if you want all of my blessings, son, if you want all of the provision I can offer you, if you want all the guidance, then, then you need to obey me, son. You need to follow my will for your life, son. And then you'll have all of my reserve, all of my resources, all of me. If you reject my will for your life, son, then it's, there's nothing I can do. You're still full of yourself. If a man is demon-possessed, God has given us power to do something about that, hasn't he? But if a man or a woman is so full of themselves, what can we do about that? Nothing. Not only the individual. You believe in the priesthood of all believers? The Bible says that. You are priests and kings under our God. Do you believe in the priesthood of all believers? And so in what way are you a priest? The priests were there to officiate in the sacrifices that were made before God, before Hashem. So in what way are you a priest? You offer a sacrifice that nobody else in the world can offer unto God. Your life. That's what he means by that. The priests were the ones who offered the sacrifice unto God on behalf of the people. You're the only one that can offer the sacrifice of your life, your being, as an offering unto God. The Holocaust. Take my life, Lord, and use it completely for your will, for your purposes, Lord. Verse 24, most assuredly, chapter 12, John's gospel, verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if, excuse me, falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Who's he talking about? He's talking about his life. He's going to die. That grain is going to be buried. Well, what's it going to produce? It's through his death and his resurrection that he produced, he birthed the church, didn't it? Yeah. Paul uses this analogy in that great chapter of the resurrection. Which chapter is that? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul uses this analogy. He says, you take a grain of corn and you plant it in the ground, and what comes up is what? Is it, is it that little kernel? It just becomes a giant kernel on steroids? What is it? It's a stalk that comes up. And on that stalk are many ears of corn. And on every one of those ears of corn are hundreds of grains, kernels of corn. Wow, very different from that which you planted, right? You ever wonder whether Christians should be cremated or not? Has anybody ever wondered that? Oh, yeah, many of you have. 
long before cremation became so popular today, who burned the bodies of their dead? Pagans. Pagans burned the bodies of their dead. Christians buried their dead. That kernel is buried into the ground. And what comes forth? Wow, we can't even imagine a glorious body. Now, now I'm not saying that a person being cremated hinders God from being able to do what he wants to do in giving them that celestial body. We have a terrestrial body right now designed for this life. But one day we're going to have a celestial body. My body will have a neck. I'll have a European cut. I'll be able to buy a suit off the rack. You know, it's going to be beautiful. <laughs> Instead of this fire hydrant I was born with, you know. <laughs> but Paul uses the same analogy when he says, you, you plant it into the ground, but what springs forth? You don't understand it's a celestial body, not a terrestrial body. So that, that's why for, for millennium, Christians buried their dead. Now, now, I understand the reasons why people cremate, okay? But if at all possible, what should you do? Bury. Bury. And then explain to family and friends who come to that memorial what it all symbolizes. And that Jesus Christ was that first grain of corn that was planted. And through his resurrection, through his glorious body, has been produced the body of Christ. No guilt. You pray about it. You do what God tells you to do. Okay? It produces much grain. Verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now, it's not about your lip service. It's about your actual service to God. He said, don't give me your lip. Give me your life. We went to court, you know, with the, with the gal who hit the church the other day. Did I tell you this? And uh, she, she, I told her how grateful we were she didn't get hurt. And I said, ever since you hit the church, you know, you got a whole church of people praying for you. Miss, Miss I won't tell you her name. And she said, I'm so thankful. I, I need it. I need it. I'm 30 days clean. I'm in a rehab program. And said, oh, that's wonderful. You know, wonderful. And then she told the judge she wanted a court-appointed attorney. She wanted to go to trial. And the judge said, you know why these two fellows are here? They have such incriminating evidence against you. Let me, let's talk. So the judge and the officer pulled her aside, and, and he wanted to be lenient with her. He wanted to help her. She, it seemed genuine. She was really sorry for her alcoholism, the situation here. So she pleaded guilty, and they wanted to know if we would be okay with them reducing the fine. And they said, we're not, we don't want to condemn anybody. We just, you know, yeah, of course we would. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? God's forgiveness, God's grace. Now, the evidence was overwhelming. She was guilty. Is the evidence overwhelming? That you're guilty of being a Christian? That you're guilty of being a follower of Jesus? That you're guilty, you Jesus freak? Huh? <laughs> it should be, right? And listen, that, that question is for you to answer. Everybody who knows you, whether they know you intimately or whether they know you casually, do they know that the center of your life, the priority of your life is Jesus Christ? And they'll know that by you're following him. You see? Verse 27 now. My, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this very purpose I came to this hour. He was born to die. He came to sacrifice his life. But listen, in his humanity, he was afraid to suffer the things he was going to be suffering, not only excruciating pain that he would go through physically, and I can't even imagine the pain that he went through. You ever have nerve pain in your body? Ooh, 
man, it, 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 can, it can, I remember uh, before my back surgery, I would have nerve pain in my back where I couldn't, I couldn't, it was, the pain was tremendous. I couldn't lay down. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't, and I would just roll on the floor back and forth, back and forth in pain. My wife would cry just watching me in pain. I thank God for the surgeon I had. John G. Heller, Atlanta Emory Spine Center. Heller is stellar. You know anybody needs an operation? <laughs> That was just one area of my body. Can you imagine the nerve pain that he was going through, having those nails driven into his wrists, his feet, the way he was beaten and bloodied, the way his skin was ripped from his back, the, the nerves being exposed. I mean, just everywhere in his body, it, it was screaming in pain. He knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Isaiah tells us he was more disfigured than any man ever had been. You wouldn't even recognize that he was a man if you saw him on the cross and looking at his face. Isaiah describes that. And the greatest suffering of all was what? Being separated, Being separated from God the Father on your behalf and mine. Wow. How courageous was our Jesus in his human form, in his humanity. What, what's courage? Well, you're, you're afraid that you could prove it. You're afraid, but you do the right thing anyway. Was Jesus troubled? Was Jesus afraid? Yeah, in his flesh he was. That's, listen, true courage. The heroes, if you, you talk to any hero, you'll find out whatever they did in heroically, they were afraid, but they did it because it was the right thing to do. Jesus, troubled. I just, want to cry. I just want to do this. What should I say? Take this cup from me? No. Then a voice, God glorified him. A voice came from heaven, verse 28, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus, all he wanted to do was glorify his father. This is the third time that a voice came from heaven, that God the Father spoke in, in the pleasure of his son. Who was it? The first time? First time God spoke from heaven? At his baptism. Second time? His transfiguration. The third time, here. He was so pleased with his son's willingness to surrender his life to the Father's will. Doesn't, that never gives a parent more joy, does it? Than to know our children are surrendered to our will. And, and we all, well, a good parent should only want the highest and best for their child, right? As God wants for us. Therefore, the people who stood by heard it and said, it had thundered. Others said, an angel had spoken to him. Jesus himself said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sakes. The father bearing witness of the ministry and the work of the son. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. What's going to happen? Satan. Satan will be cast to the earth. Has he been? No. Not yet. Will he? Yeah. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. It'll be a tar time of spiritual darkness such as the world has never seen before nor will ever see again when Satan is cast to the earth. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's yet to happen. It's yet to take place. Now is the judgment of this world now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw many, all peoples to myself. This is the victory through his surrender. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. And the people answered and said, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how is it that you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is the son of man? Now, all they wanted to hear was the, re, the, the triumphant, the reigning, the conquering Messiah. That's all they ever wanted to hear. But there was a whole half of the Messiah's ministry that they're not even thinking about or concentrating on. And what was that? His suffering. Isaiah describes both the suffering servant of God and then the reigning triumphant servant of God. The suffering Messiah, the conquering Messiah. The first time he comes on a colt of a donkey in peace to surrender his life, to yield his life for God so loved that he gave. The next time he comes triumphant on a white horse to take possession of that which is rightfully his, this world. And I believe that day is very soon. Very soon.
Verse 35, Jesus said to them, and this is very important. My emphasis this morning is right here in this verse. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become the sons of light. The Romans sought glory, right? The Greeks sought, the Jews sought light. Was there a light to be sought after in the Old Testament? Was there a light to be sought after in the Old Testament? And who would bear witness of that light? Mainly the prophets, right? David caught on. The psalmist David said, the Lord is the light of my life and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? For the Lord is the strength of my life. Who shall I be afraid of? Right? So there was a light to be followed, a light to receive, a light to seek after in the Old Testament. And how many did that? Very few, a remnant. But they did seek the light and they found the light. And there was nothing for them to be afraid of and the Lord was their strength and their joy. But most went into darkness, deep darkness. And we know what happened if you look at the history of Israel in the Old Testament. It's not good. Now, now the actual light of the world, the light of God is there among them. And he's saying, follow the light while you have the light. There's coming a day when you'll no longer have the light with you. Follow the light. And what did they do? They wanted to snuff out the light. They wanted to put out the light. And he said, if you do that, you'll go into deep darkness. What happened to Israel when they attempted to put out the light? They went into captivity. They were dispersed throughout the nations of the world, never to exist again. The, the completeness of the judgment that God had prophesied against them in the Old Testament because of the rejection of the light. And that, that didn't end until May of 1948. Amazing what's happening now. Okay, is there a light today that people should be following or they go into darkness? Yes. And yes, what did you say? You're the light. The church is the light today. The true church, the body of Christ. I'm not talking about Chris and Dumb. You know, like Capital Baptists and others. You know, this, this. I, I'm, I'm talking about the true body of Christ. Where, where to be the light? You alone are the light of the world. You alone are the salt of the earth. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? When are you going to do it? Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> Invite me to your dinner party. I can spoil it for you. <laughs> no, it should, it should be a celebration, right? Now, listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus gave them the opportunity to follow the light. They refused. He left. They went into complete darkness. The nation dispersed throughout the nations of the world. The temple destroyed all of their religious life. Not even to be an acknowledged national entity ever for almost 2,000 years. What's going to happen to this world when they reject the light that can be seen, that can be followed, that they can realize through the church? What's going to happen? Because more and more, do you understand, more and more, not just the world, but our society is reject, rejecting the true church, rejecting the body of Christ, rejecting the truth of the gospel. Do you see that? More and more and more it's happening. And what's going to happen? Once that light is removed... Right? The prophets, which one of them did you not kill? Jesus said. He said, you have the light a little while longer. And then they killed him and he left. What's going to happen very soon? This light is going to be removed. Paul talks about that in his uh, eschatological exposition in you know, First and Second Thessalonians. It's all about eschatology, right? And so he said, listen, listen, that man of sin, oh, Satan is going to be cast to the earth, isn't he? Is he? He absolutely is. But right now, something is restraining not just Satan from being cast to the earth, but, but that man of sin that he's going to possess, who's going to come to power, the devil himself on earth ruling. Wow! Woo. Isn't that scary? Yeah. Now, when's that going to take place? After right after the light is gone. 
the light of the church, the Holy Spirit working through you. You need, you must bear witness of the truth in a dark and dying world. We're leaving here soon. At least I expect to. I'm not bold enough to stay here. No, no. Other people are bold enough, Lord. I want to go with you. <laughs> when the church is raptured, Satan will be cast to the earth. Evil will be taking over the globe such as we've never, ever, ever seen before. They will go into a deep, deep, deep darkness. <sighs> last week around the back deck, it was a beautiful day last week, wasn't it? When we came out of church. And someone said, oh, this would, this would be a perfect day. No, it won't. It's not going to be a day like this when Jesus returns. Nothing like this. And I, asked, I said to that person, I said, you know, you go home and you study what the Bible has to say about the second coming of Christ and what it's going to be like then. And then you come back and you tell me. What's it going to be like? Frightening. A day of deep, deep darkness. A day of storms. A day of cloudiness. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to look like it's, it's never been more desperate on the planet than it is right now, Lord. And that'll be the kind of a day it is. So don't, and don't be afraid. For the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? For the Lord is my strength. Whom shall I be afraid? Is that true? All right, all right. Now, just as, listen, just as Jesus is declaring here, it happened previously, they rejected the light of the prophets. Here it is, they're rejecting the light of their own Messiah. And this world, this world right now is rejecting the only light that is here now in the body of Christ. You. You. My question is, are you going to be that light? Even where there is darkness. Now, it's easy to be the light in the light, Right? Paul says to Thessalonians, he who restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Who is the he? Who is the he? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's leaving? The church is leaving. It's the influence of the Holy Spirit working through the church that's going to be removed. Then Satan will be cast to the earth. Then that man of sin will be revealed. And then, and then the world will see what a dictatorship really looks like, an evil dictatorship, Right? But the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit carries all the attributes of God. God is omnipresent. What does that mean? It means that, that, that a place cannot exist anywhere in the, in, the, in the known universe that God is not. So, so the God is not being removed. The Holy Spirit's not being removed. It's the influence of the Holy Spirit working through the church that's going to be removed. We're restraining. We're that light. Do not be surprised that the darkness is rejecting the light more and more and more. Which of the prophets did you not kill? Why do you seek to kill me, Jesus said. Why are they trying to silence the church, you and me? They are. But it's okay. It's okay. It's part of God's plan, isn't it? Yeah. While you have the light, believe in the light. Verse 36, that you may be sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Verse 37, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Faith comes by and hearing by. Miracles do not produce faith. Emotional experiences your feelings, nothing more than feelings, do not produce faith. It's very clear here. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead. The multitude of Jews that were in the wilderness wandering saw more miracles than any people group ever on the face of the earth in history that God had performed for them. And yet they wandered in unbelief for 40 years. Be very, beloved, please, be very careful. Faith comes by hearing, by knowing the word of God, by receiving it in your mind and allowing it to go down into your heart and to change your life. It's not those, you know. Hey, I'm an emotional guy. Don't get me wrong. My wife can tell you. Very emotional person. I cannot be led by my emotions. I got to be led by my thinking. Right? 
Orthodoxy leads to orthopraxis. Right thinking, right living, right thinking, right living. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Not miracles, not emotional experiences. So many people today seeking miracles. I, 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 it brings me to nausea. Listening to these apostles who are raising people from the dead today. Do you, think, do you really think any of these people have raised anybody from the dead? No. no. They're charlatans. They're hucksters. And, and the crowd is so gullible. The crowd are not grounded in the word of God. They're looking for the sensational. Show us the miraculous. Give us a sign. No sign shall be given you except that of the prophet Jonah. As he was three days and three nights in the, in the belly of the great fish. So the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the sign. I'm going to resurrect from the dead. I'm going to send up to heaven. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. And that'll be the sign to you. My people perish, why? They're looking for the we, looking for the sensation, looking for the experience. They're not looking for the truth. The most righteous and spiritual people you'll ever meet, you know who they are? They're quietly, humbly surrendered to the Lord and living out in obedience to his will, to his word every day, every day. Being a witness in their life and their testimony. Those are the most spiritual people you ever meet. Be careful. Jesus said in the last days that signs and wonders would come even to deceive the elect if it were possible. The elect. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is the, the reasons for unbelief. God has allowed that because of the hardness of men's hearts. Verse 39, therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah had said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. At least they should see with their eyes and at least they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw the glory and spoke of him. When did Isaiah see his, Isaiah see his glory? Chapter who? Six. six. What happened in chapter six? Yeah. What was the context? The context. King Uzziah had died. Ronald Reagan is no more the president. <laughs> Uzziah was like uh, the Ronald Reagan of his day, okay? But he reigned for a long time, 40 plus years. And that's the, the only king that, that Isaiah knew. And then uh, he, he died. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? Oh no. Listen. Your hope is not in a political party. Your hope is not in a politician. Now, we pray. We, we seek to gain knowledge, and we vote according to what we believe is important to God, right? And, and then we leave the rest to him. But our trust is in God. And that's the context. As Isaiah is, is, is so angst, so in, 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 troubled over the fact that Uzziah died, now he looks where he should look, who's really in control. Who's that? God. And more, listen, more and more, more and more as time goes on, you're going to wonder what in the shio is going on, right? Look to God and don't be troubled. The Lord is the light of my life and my, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. To whom should I be afraid? You need to memorize that verse. Because as it does get darker and darker and darker out there, you're going to be tested. Now, what it, what, test is a bad word. What's in you is going to be revealed. We probably will have to eliminate half the chairs in here. I, I don't say that with joy in my heart, but there is a time coming that is going to be revealing what's really in people's hearts in the relationship to the Lord. The huge crowd gathered together, chapter 6. And then he began to talk on the true cost of discipleship. You, want, you, sure, you sure you want to follow me? And then John 6, 6, 6. Many of them walked with him no more. And then he said to the 12, will you, will you two leave me? One was a betrayer. Ten ran to the hills to save their own lives. One. One 
stayed with him in fidelity, in love, in self-sacrifice, one. Lord, let us be that one. Only by your strength, Lord. Verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. At least they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And be careful, beloved. Don't follow people who are looking for their own self-aggrandizement, looking for the praise of men. We need to be children of the light, speaking the truth no matter what it might cost us, Right? Many of the uh, sect of the Pharisees believed, but almost no one of the sect of the Sadducees believed. Why? The Sadducees were the materialists. They, were, they would be considered the left. The Pharisees were the right. The Pharisees, when they began, they were the back to the Bible people. That's why so many of the Pharisees, the sect of the Pharisees, did believe, but they were afraid to say anything. They didn't want to get excommunicated. Who got excommunicated? One of the richest men in Israel? Nicodemus. He got excommunicated. He lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his wealth, and eventually lost his life. But he was one. Who was the other? Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea. So there were many. He's pointing out. Not, not, bad choice of words. There were few. Not many. Few. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Who's that guy in the Bible? His name means Mr. Popular? Demas. Demas was a companion of Paul's for a while. He was, uh, for temporarily, a disciple of Paul's. And then Demas left Paul. It's interesting that Demas' name means popular. Paul would record later on, he said, Demas left me for the love of this world. World. I've, I've met so many sparkler Christians. You know? You know sparkler Christians? You like that sparkler and shh. No, I, 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 and I know I'm going to meet many more, you know, for a time. They were among us, John will write in his Johannine epistle, but they were not with us. Someone asked me the other day if we have membership here. Uh, do we have a membership here, David? Do we have a membership? I asked a person to hold up their hand, and they held up their hand. I said, and I touched their fingers. I said, that's not my finger. That's not my thumb. That's not me. No, 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 no. Oh, these are my fingers. I, these are my father's hands. What happened? <laughs> no, no, the, this is my hand. These are my hands. These are my fingers. This is my nose, my ears. My body knows its body. I said, we don't have a membership. You, you may be among us, but you're not with us. The body knows the body, don't we? We're family. Family knows family. When you really become part of the communion, part of the kononia. Now, there'll always be people who are uh, among us, but not with us, and they'll come and they'll go, and we. Don't you be that. Don't you be that person. Hmm? And, and I don't mean following this church. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I mean staying with the Lord. It's always a joy to see people go out and they're serving the Lord and they're staying with the Lord and God has given them a ministry. You know, the purpose of the church is the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And, and so God may be moving you out of here for ministry. Well, praise God. That's a good thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you get tired of serving and walking with the Lord. You can get tired in ministry, and that's completely acceptable. What you should, ne what should never happen is what? Get tired of ministry. Never, ever, ever should you be tired of serving the Lord, of walking with the Lord, of following the Lord. Ever. You get weary. Jesus got weary. But you'll never get tired of ministry. Just get tired in ministry. Amen? Amen. We need to finish. He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sent me sees, sent me, see, uh, sees him whom he, who sent me. 
meaning God the Father. I have come as a light into the world, and whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. What's going to judge him? Truth. Hey, I'm, I'm thankful, right? That, that truth did prevail, at least for that young boy's life. Kyle, written house, right? Yeah. But, it, it, I mean, it was kind of a nail-biter, wasn't it? it was. To see if his character was going to be assassinated, his life destroyed. It could still happen. But let me tell you something. Don't ever, ever, ever think that evil will succeed. It will not. Every devil gets their due, every saint their reward, and it's based upon truth, God's truth, God's word. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you think. I was at breakfast yesterday. There was a fellow who asked me a question. What do you think, Pastor? It doesn't matter what I think. What's the Bible say? Amen. What does the word of God say? That's what I'll tell you. Matters little what I think or feel or you think or you feel because I'm going to stand and be judged by the word of God. And so are you. And so is this world that has so rejected his word. Yeah. You know, it's going to be easier and easier for them, for them to reject the light and claim to be in the light. Ne next week, I guess, next week when we talk about Advent, and we talk about traditions of the church. The contemporary church believes that somehow, erroneously, they went from Acts, boom, to today. Bypassing all of church history. Now, much of church history is not good. Much of church history is wonderful. Wonderful. We are the children of the church history, of the church throughout the generations. We are the product of 2,000 years of the ecclesia. Is that not true? The contemporary church thinks they went right from the book of Acts to today, and they're so far removed from where the book of Acts church was. <laughs> No understanding, no idea. And, and, now, and now they want to unhitch the church from what part of the Bible? Oh, man. They, they want to get away with all, get, get rid of all that tradition, get rid of all of that Jewishness, that Israel stuff, you know. And what do they want to do with regard to our government's foundings? They want to eliminate what? They want to rewrite the Constitution. They want to get rid of the Bill of Rights. You see, you have to destroy all of these wonderful traditions and say that it wasn't true. Yeah. I can't believe I'm in a room with all these racist people. <laughs> you whiteies. Ooh. Well, there's one thing I know about you. You can't clap for nothing. You know. <laughs> no, you, watch your, you ever watch your kids? You know, they, they got no rhythm at all. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. All right, here we go. Last two verses. How are you going to be judged? By the, By the word. How are you going to be judged? How are you going to be judged? So you better know the word. It doesn't matter what you think or how you feel. Do you know the word? Someone made some preposterous statement the other day, and I said, What's the, what, can you give me the proof text for that? You know what they said to me? That's what I think. Who cares what you think? <laughs> For I have not spoken, verse 49 now, on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Praise the Lord. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. This is the end of his public ministry. Now, next week, Advent, next week, I'm going to teach through the four seasons of Advent. What, what are the four themes of Advent? First, next week is what? Hope. 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 The following week? Peace. Peace. The next week? Joy. Joy. The last? Love. And then? Christ. Christmas. Yeah, Christ. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach through 
John, the remaining chapters, uh, next four chapters of John, and emphasize each of those aspects of Advent. Now listen to me. Hope, peace, joy, love, that all comes from God. Those, those should be qualities of God that we are expressing and, and displaying to people, manifesting all the time if we really are walking in the light, following the light. Now, you're going to have the next four weeks to really prepare your heart for the private ministry that Jesus has for you. I would suggest to you that to some extent there's evidence that the public ministry of Jesus has ended in the United States. I love the way the Bible becomes so applicable to the day and time in which I live. But I would suggest to you that the public ministry of Jesus has ended here. It's apostate. It's an abomination. But the private ministry of Jesus to the body of Christ is never going to become more intimate, more powerful, more life-changing. Listen, this is the last week of his life. They're going to kill him. And they want to kill all of his followers. But he draws together with them in this wonderful, holy communion of Passover. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is the most intimate fellowship with Jesus in the scriptures. It's the most revealing. It's the most tender. It's the most loving. It's the most impacting. It's the most powerful, life-changing. If, if you study through the next five chapters of John, it'll change your life. Now, that's my hope and prayer, that as we go through the season of Advent, that you will draw closer to Jesus than you ever, ever, ever have before. Because, listen to me, I, I don't want the public ministry. I want the private ministry of Jesus. I don't want to say, you know, I didn't get it. I, I, you know, I, I'm up clueless. I want to be like Mary. I know exactly what you're doing, Lord. Although I, I may be grieved at what is happening in the death of so much that I have loved. Lord, I know your will is perfect and that all things work together for good. So let me pour out my life as an offering unto you this season. Let my life, my home, my world be filled with the fragrance of Jesus like that house was. I want to challenge you. The next few weeks should be the most intimate in your experience with Jesus. Let's pray to that end. Pastor David, you come forward. And I want to pray with you. Lord, I do pray before I step down, Lord, that you would accomplish all that you desire to do in the lives of all of us here and those in my hearing, those who are among us, Lord, who are, may not be here today, Lord. I do believe the public ministry that you had for this nation is over. You've accomplished your will. It was the safest place for your people for such a long time. But now more than ever, the private ministry that you have for your body, for we, the body of Christ, Lord, can begin and be experienced. And so, Lord, I pray that over the next four weeks, culminating in the celebration of, of your incarnation, your coming, your birth, Jesus, draw closer to us than we ever have before. Give us that privilege, Lord. You alone give the seeing eye. You alone give the hearing ear. You alone give the believing heart. You alone give us the, the courage and the ability to allow our lives to be changed. May we draw closer to you now, Jesus, in that intimacy, in that communion, in that koinonia, in that partnership, in that contribution, like never, ever, ever before, Lord. In your holy name I ask it. And everyone said, amen. Shall we stand? Mm -hmm.